Good evening, everyone. Welcome this evening to the Safe Cities Live page. And it's a pleasure to be praying with you again this evening um, as we are currently observing some time in prayer and fasting. The reason that we have taken this step is because we've realized that many of you and also um, in our extended families, households, churches um, are despondent and discouraged, um, especially because of the um, consequences of this pandemic. Uh, a lot of people that we know have passed away and also many people have lost their jobs, uh, lost their income and um, and at this time, we want to, to celebrate the Lord and give thanks to him for his goodness. 
none of us are lacking anything. And if you are lacking anything, um, I want you to remember that you have a family, um, a spiritual father, a household who care about you. And um, I want to encourage you to reach out uh, to somebody who may be able to help you. Well, this evening, um, I want to continue with a series that we have started on your personal protective equipment, your personal protective equipment. And I say to you that um, with everything that's happening around us at the moment, um, it is quite a phenomenon how the whole world have to use masks and how everybody globally are speaking about sanitizing your hands, washing your hands, observing social distance. And these are things that just for a short while back, we haven't even heard of. And suddenly it has swept across the face of the globe. And, and these uh, uh, wearing a mask has now become a new fashion. And wherever we go, we just see bottles of sanitizer. And, and these things are not happening for nothing. We have to understand that the Bible says um, that it's God that plays a pandemic upon a people. And when these things begin to happen and, and there are changes in our environments and things happening globally, we have to pay attention because it's often the Lord speaking to us. And the Lord is capable of speaking to us through events, through circumstances, and even symbolically through the things that are happening around us. Now, when we're looking at these two phenomenal things that's happening to us right now, that puts a lot of emphasis on um, two parts of your body, and that is your hands and your mouth. Um, we can definitely relate this to scripture and us as the church can say that this is what the Lord is currently saying to us. Um, firstly, wearing a mask. I have shared this with you, um, that the mask is significant in protecting your heart and the sanitizer is significant in protecting your hands. And hopefully I'll be able to share a bit about that this evening again we'll see how the holy spirit leads but we have been speaking about um the armor of god and you know that the armor of god has been given for us uh, for our protection and as i said last week i grew up with this um putting on the armor of god and uh, every morning i had this thing um, when I have to get up in the morning, I would be praying and I would symbolically or, or visualize how I am putting on the armor of God until I grew into maturity. And the Lord said to me, why are you taking, taking it out or taking these things off? Um, it's not necessary to put it on every day because you should, you should never be taking it off. And we begin to uh, search the scriptures and understand that there's a deeper meaning to these things. Now, I want to highlight in Ephesians 6, uh, firstly, when you begin to read Ephesians 6, it speaks about obedience. And it continues to, uh, to verse 10, where it moves more into um, a place of spiritual warfare. And the Bible says, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. So we discussed this last week and you, you may go and, um, and watch uh, the video as it should be here below on our page. Um, then verse 14 says, stand therefore having girded your waist with truth having put on the breastplate of righteousness and having shot your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all, taking the shield of faith 
which you will be able to squinch all the fiery darts of the wicked one and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. Now, the reason that I have chosen this particular portion of scripture, because we're focusing on prayer and, sub, uh, and supplication and fasting, um, is also because um, we got in ABC Ministries, we're currently uh, busy with a series on the successful habits of, um, of one that prays. And I want you to also go and listen to that series by Dr. S.Y. Govender, and also just to uh, give him, my spiritual father, all the credit this evening, as much of the content that I'm sharing with you on this page is uh, what I have been learning from uh, Dr. S.Y. Govender. So you're welcome to go and visit his page, visit his website, and you may draw some information from there. Well, I have come to the conclusion when I'm reading Ephesians 6, especially because of the last part. And also, if you investigate all these elements uh, um, of, of the armor, that this armor does not protect you from the back. It protects you from every side. It protects your head. It protects your, your heart. It protects your um, entire body, even your feet. But it doesn't protect your back. Um, now, the last part that we read of the armor in, uh, in verse 18, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints, implies that this is your protection from the back. And if you're not part of a spiritual family where people are praying for you and constantly interceding for you, it means that you do not have that part of the, of the armor of God covered in your life. Now, I've also concluded um, in studying this um, portion of scripture over the last week or two, that every part of the armor of God is a requirement for prayer. Before you can come to that place where you're praying with all um, uh, perseverance and supplication for the saints, you need to have every part of this armor. And last week we spoke about truth, that you cannot pray without truth in your life. The Bible says, my people perish for a lack of knowledge. It is because they have not come to the truth. And therefore, a lot of people pray amiss. They do not know the truth, so they don't know how to pray. And we discussed that last week. And I said to you also that every part of the armor of God is actually Christ. There's a scripture that says that we must put on Christ. And when you're putting on truth, you are putting on Christ. Christ is truth. Is the way, the truth, and the life. Christ is our righteousness. Christ is our faith. Christ is our peace. Christ is the word of God. So every part of the armor of God is actually Christ, and we ought to put him on. Now, um, we spoke about truth. Today, I want to just focus during our prayer session on the second aspect of um, the armor of God, and that is righteousness. He says that we must take up the whole armor, and then he says, um, stand therefore, in verse 14, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness. And what is a breastplate? A breastplate protects your heart. It protects you from the enemy taking out your heart or shooting you in your heart. And um, when we speak about the heart, you know, we use phrases like this in church. Um, I call it um, churchianity, um, where people say, you must give your heart to the Lord. 
But when we speak about the heart or refer to the heart, we're actually speaking about the mind. When we say the heart, we're talking about the center of a thing, like the heart of your motor car is the engine. Without the engine, you know, you're not going anywhere. The heart of your computer is, is the hard drive. Without a hard drive, your computer is not going anywhere. So when we're talking about the heart of a man, we're actually talking about your mind. The Bible says, as man think in his heart, so is he. But you're not actually thinking in your heart. You're thinking with your mind. Your mind is considered the heart. Uh, the, out of your mind, there flow the issues of life. And everything that you think of, your secret thoughts, um, everything that you, that you aspire to, um, your aspirations, your desires, even your secret desires, um, your emotions, your thoughts, all of these things are actually forming part of your heart. And um, now, uh, just to get back to the personal protective equipment, um, the Bible says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And therefore, I believe that it's very symbolic for us as a church today to understand how to put a weight before your mouth, to understand how to use your mouth effectively, because um, the mouth reveals what is in your heart. And every time you open your mouth and speak, you actually reveal what is in your heart. So how do you protect your heart? You protect your heart by covering your mouth. And that is symbolic to me about the kind of protection that the Lord has given us today um, by putting a mask on your mouth. The second thing is um, cleaning your hands. Now, um, I want to remind you about the scripture in the book of Revelation speaking about the mark of the beast. During this time, during this pandemic, a lot of people are speaking about the mark of the beast and the antichrist and how Jesus is going to return really soon. And a lot of this information are actually um, uh, a proof that people have been mis misinformed and a lot of people in the church today are being misinformed. Uh, when we study the scriptures in the book of Revelation, we have to understand that Revelation is symbolic. Revelation 1 verse 1 says that these things he signified. So it is symbolic. Here yeah, John is on the island of Patmos in prison and he's writing letters to the church and he has to send these letters with the Roman soldiers. And everything that he writes to them is in symbolic language because obviously he didn't want them to know these secrets that God is revealing to the church and how he's going to allow the church to overcome. Um, obviously, uh, John was not going to write these things in um, a literal sense. Now, this kind of language is not strange to, uh, to the people in the church at that point because they were used to Jesus speaking in symbolic language. They were used to Jesus speaking um, in parabolic language or, or speaking by the means of parables. Um, and this should not be difficult for us to understand. We speak like that every day. We speak like that to our children. Our language is highly symbolic. And I don't understand why people in the church um, do not understand symbolic language when it comes to uh, the word of God. I mean, Jesus said, um, eat my flesh and drink my blood. That obviously was highly symbolic. And there's many other um, symbols uh, that we know in the word of God. And I don't want to go into that this evening because our focus this evening is on, on prayer and fasting. But I do want to mention to you that um, the scripture in Revelation that speaks about the mark of the beast on the forehead and the mark of the beast on the right hand is not a mark or a tattoo or an engravement or even a chip that someone is going to put on your forehead or put in your right hand. It's very simple. What this mark indicates is, um, uh, first of all, the mark on the forehead speaks about the mind of the beast. It means that you will begin to think just like the beast. And obviously, uh, for a, 
a company of people who think like the beast, um, they will begin to act just like the beast. So if that mark is on your forehead, it's also going to be on your right hand. Whatever you think about, whatever you meditate on, eventually is going to culminate in your actions. And it's going to manifest through the things that you do, through the works of your hands. So uh, the Bible also says that for this company of people who do not have the mark of the beast, on their forehead or on their hand, they will not be able to trade, they will not be able to do business, young and old. And we already see that happening. It's not a new thing for us. Um, today, uh, it's very difficult to go for your driver's license if you're not paying a bribe. Many people all around our country are daily paying for bribes to get their driver's license and they feel absolutely nothing about it. They don't feel um, convicted at all because it seems to be the norm. Um, many driving schools are still demanding bribes or even manipulating people to pay bribes because um, to them it is also just the norm. And um, uh, and so, uh, hence, we see many uh, dysfunctional drivers on our, on our roads and um, the battles that we have with taxi drivers and uh, all these accidents and problems that we, in, that we experience on our roads. Now, that's a typical example of how one thinks like the beast and practice um, what you think about. Um, our country or our nation is engaging in the highest levels of fraud and corruption. And these things doesn't happen just automatically. A person doesn't just get up in the morning and just start acting out these, um, uh, these um, uh, things of the beast, but um, they first start meditating upon it. They start thinking about it. And um, in the court of law, this would be called premeditated uh, actions. So uh, a lot of sin is premeditated. And obviously what you think about is eventually what you're going to do. And that's what the Bible says. Think upon these things, meditate on these things, things that are pure, things that are wholesome, things that are beautiful, things that are heavenly. Um, we ought to think about the word of God. And everybody speaks about the mark of the beast on their forehead, the mark of the beast on the right hand. But very few people actually speaks about the mark of Christ. The book of Revelation also speaks about having the mark of Christ or the name of Christ on your forehead. When you have the name of Christ, you're thinking like him. When his name is on your forehead, it means that you have the mind of Christ, that your mind has been transformed into the image of Christ. And that means obviously it's going to manifest in your actions. Now, um, if you wear the mask, it means that you are busy cultivating your heart that you're busy um, protecting your heart through the words that you are speaking. And also sanitizing your hands means the cleansing of your hands. And as in the Bible says, who will ascend into my holy hill? Who will ascend to Zion? Who will get to that place of, of perfection? But him who has a pure heart and clean hands a pure heart and clean hands. And that to me is the beautiful picture of those who are wearing their masks and sanitizing their hands. And obviously social distancing has to do with it because the Bible says, uh, do not be part of the world. Do not love the world and the things of the world. He says, come out from amongst them and be separate from them. And so I'm not saying that you must be separate from everybody. I'm saying that we need to adhere to what scripture is telling us. This is how you can protect yourself. Now, why am I speaking about personal protection? The Bible says he who keeps himself, Satan cannot touch him. There is personal responsibility attached to this. Gone are the days when you just become a Christian and, oh, God will take care of everything. No, there's personal protection um, 
demanded from every believer. The Bible says that you must work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. This means that every believer must grow into a mature son of God. Every believer must take care of his own salvation. You have to physically uh, purify your heart. You have to physically wash your hands, cleanse your hands. And this is through your meditation, the things that you think about, the things that you read about, the things that you're watching, the things that you engage with, and also your actions and the things that you do. Now, the reason that I'm speaking about that this evening is because my focus is on this breastplate of righteousness, how this breastplate is going to protect you, how this breastplate is going to bring righteousness into your life. Uh, when we speak about righteousness and these beautiful uh, scriptures that we can look at uh, this evening, just to mention one or two scriptures to you, the Bible says in Psalms 141 verse 5, let the righteous strikes me, strike me, for it shall be a kindness. Let him rebuke me, it shall be as an excellent oil. Let my head not refuse it. For still my prayer is against the deeds of the wicked. David speaks here about how his prayer is against the wicked and how he desires the correction and the discipline of a righteous person. Proverbs 15 verse 29 says, The Lord is far from the wicked, but he hears the prayer of the righteous. He hears the prayer of the righteous. I say to you that without this breastplate of righteousness, you do not qualify to pray for the saints. We often get invited to prayer meetings. People, um, I come out of a, a, a culture of, uh, of prayer. We were always praying. We had united prayer meetings. We had prayer conferences. We had prayer um workshops, uh, even meditation workshops. We had all night prayers. We had prayer camps. Man, we were praying and praying. We were prayed out. Until I began to realize that instead of working on prayer, you should be working on your righteousness. Because the Bible says that he hears the prayer of the righteous. And is this not what James 5 tells us? Confess your trespasses to one another. Pray for one another that you may be healed. That is, that is uh, praying for the saints. And then he says in the same breath, he says, the effective fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. Yeah, the power is actually not in the prayer. It is actually locked up in the person praying. The quality of the prayer is in the condition of the person's heart. No wonder the Bible says in 1 Peter 3 verse 12, for the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous and his ears are open to their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. No, God does not answer everybody's prayer. God does not answer everybody's prayer. God is attracted to a person who is righteous. He's attracted to a person who has the breastplate. Now, since we are um, uh, spending some time fasting, and I said for 21 days, but we may extend it as the Holy Spirit leads. And we're not all fasting with the abstention from food because fasting has taken on a new meaning for us when we are um, discussing Isaiah 58. The Lord says in Isaiah 58, verse 6, is this not the fast that I have chosen? To lose the bonds of wickedness and undo the heavy burdens, to let the oppressed go free and that you break every yoke. This is the fast that God demands from us, that we break the yokes in people's lives, that we let the oppressed go free. Now for years now, for many years, the church has been focusing on fasting by the abstention of food. And I have not seen the fruit 
of this kind of fasting. Yes, in my personal life, I did. I have seen some fruit. For instance, when I fasted for um, for uh, about forty days, the Lord started revealing some things um, to me um, about people who were very close to me and what they were engaging in, and that was more concerning my personal life. Uh, I started seeing visions and dreams. And yes, that was really very fruitful because it brought direction into my life. You may abstain from food. If you want to come closer to the Lord and you want to, to abstain from food by means of saying what Jesus said, that, um, that his will is my meat and the food that I eat. And Jeremiah said that um, I love the word and I ate it. And sometimes that's our desire to grow closer to the Lord. But um, right now, I don't feel that that's the kind of fast that God has called us to because of the deeper revelation that we have in the word of God about fasting. He says, is this not the fast that I have chosen? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and that you bring to your house the poor who are cast out? When you see the naked, you cover him and not hide yourself from your own flesh your healing shall spring forth speedily and your righteousness shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. I said to you that in the armor of God, there's no protection mentioned from behind. But yes, your protection from behind. Your protection is when you begin to do righteous acts. These are called mustard seeds. It is acts of righteousness. If you begin to engage in these things, obviously it's not things that you're going to advertise. It's things that you're going to do personally. Take care of the, uh, the poor, take care of a widow, take care of an orphan, um, share your bread with the hungry. These are secret acts of righteousness. And when you begin to, to um, uh, operate in this level of secret acts of righteousness, you will see what I have um, experienced in my own life is that you will never lack anything. The Lord will take care of you. You will never uh, be uh, in lack of bread. Um, the Lord will take care of you. And it's not, is that not what he says? Is that the righteous will never beg for bread. God will always be your provider. He will always take care, care of you. And it says that your light shall break forth in the morning. And it says that your righteousness shall go before you. This means that righteousness is your personal assistant. Righteousness is your PA. It is like John in the wilderness that goes ahead to prepare a way in the wilderness. You have a personal assistant that can go ahead of you. And that that girl's name is righteousness. She's going to go ahead. She's going to prepare your way. If you practice righteousness, what am I talking about? I'm not talking about the righteousness of Christ in you. That's his righteousness. You are a partaker of his righteousness, and that is free of charge. But I'm not talking about free grace today. There is free grace, and there is dominion grace. There's salvation grace and dominion grace. And that salvation, that grace is free. Uh, salvation is free. But there's another grace which is called dominion grace. That grace you receive because of your personal responsibility and actions. You can attract dominion grace. Dominion grace is there for you to be an overcomer. How come there's so many people in the church who are saved, born again, baptized in water, baptized in the Holy Spirit, speaking in tongues, yet they are not overcomers. They are defeated Christians living in a life of sin, always sick, always depressed, always having problems, always fighting demons. That is because they have not experienced how to partake of dominion grace. Dominion grace is the thing that is going to give you, um, give you unfair advantage, give you the favor that God has promised you as a son of God on the earth. And so um, that grace, 
you can receive through acts of righteousness practical righteousness if you want every prayer to be effective you see there's some people who pray that some of their prayers are answered other people i know none of their prayers are ever answered then there's some people that i know who have all of their prayers answered 100 percent success rate how do they get that right that is because they live a life of righteousness now these are practical righteousness the bible says that um uh see that uh, if you seek god seek the kingdom of god and his righteousness these things will be added seek first the kingdom of god and his righteousness now the kingdom of god already includes righteousness the kingdom is righteousness peace and joy in the holy spirit so he says seek first righteousness peace and joy in the holy spirit and his righteousness so there's two kinds of righteousness there's positional righteousness which means that you are positioned with christ in heavenly places and you have his righteousness imputed righteousness but there's another righteousness and that is practical acts of righteousness these are things that you can do on your own to become like christ this is the dimension of watch and follow imitate me do as he has done and these things are very simple and we've been teaching this for years and you should know all those who are connected to me you should know this off by heart but for the sake of what we are focusing on and meditating on this evening we'll go through it very quickly righteousness is reverential speech how you speak to your husband how you speak to your wife how you speak to your children how you speak to your parents, how you speak to your employees, um, how you speak to the taxi driver when he just cuts in front of you. The words that comes out of your mouth determines the condition of your heart. We are kings. We should be speaking like kings. We should dec decree and declare like kings. So um, righteousness is reverential speech. Righteousness is internal purity, the thoughts of your heart, what you do when no one is watching. Righteousness is good works, as, as I've explained, taking care of widows, taking care of orphans, taking care of your animal, not kicking your dog when no one is watching, um, taking care of the environment, not throwing your coke can in the road. All of these things are part of practical righteousness. Then there is humility. Humble yourself. God is attracted to one who's humble. The Bible says God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. What about temperance, being sober-minded? Fairness, treating all people fairly, not discriminating against a certain gender, or a certain race, or a certain age code. Then there's obedience. And this scripture um, that leads into the armor of God in Ephesians 6 speaks about obedience. It says, children, obey your parents in the Lord. It speaks about how employees must obey their masters. Righteousness is sincerity. Righteousness is not compromising. And all these things are practical acts of righteousness. You cannot wait for the Lord to do everything. As a son of God, he's given you the ability to become practically righteous. Similarly, when you walk into a shopping center, you can't wait for the security guard to put the mask on you. You have personal responsibility to wear your mask and to sanitize your hands. You cannot wait for the Lord to do these things for you. You need to take personal responsibility to make sure that you live a clean life before him. And righteousness especially has to do with the things that you are doing when no one is watching. The secret acts, 
your secret thoughts, what you do in the dark places, everything that is done in the dark will be revealed in the light. And we are moving closer and closer to the light of God. As the true church is beginning to manifest on the face of the earth, light is beginning to manifest. And the appearance of the sons of God are going to expose the wickedness of those who are sons of disobedience. For this purpose, the sons of God is manifesting to destroy the works of the devil. Our battle is not against flesh and blood. We need to understand that they are uh, demonic forces working in the background to prevent you to come to your maturity in Christ. But I want to encourage you this evening. And even as we come to the table of the Lord, it is our culture every evening that we take our children and our family together around the table, share the word, share some spiritual truths, lay our hands on them and pray for them and celebrating Christ at his table. And this is an important culture. And this culture must be resident in every home of a believer. And when we do this, we come to be stable. It's a memorial before the Lord. We remember what he has done for us. When we break the bread, we remember that his body was broken for us. By his stripes, we are healed. And now he, he is the bread of life that came down from heaven. But we are becoming that bread. Together we are one loaf and we are partaking of one another. At this table, we are part of that loaf. And therefore, when we partake of this bread, we are intimate with one another. <clears throat> we are also intimate with the Lord, but we are partaking of grace from one another. And that is why we are desiring to meet again. We're desiring to fellowship physically again. We cannot do this on the internet um, uh, for much longer. Uh, soon we will be coming together again. The Lord doesn't want us to have cyber meetings. He wants us to see one another to speak to one another, to partake of the grace there is resident in one another. And then also we partake of the cup. We partake of the cup of the new covenant. His blood that was shed for the remission of sin. When we drink from this cup, we are partaking of his sufferings, but we also partaking of his spirit. We also partaking of the life that is in his spirit. In his spirit, this life. This life is higher than biological life. This life is higher than any other form of life. This is the Zoe life, the Zoe kind of life, the God kind of life. And he said, I have come for you to have life and have it more abundantly. So as we're partaking of this table this evening, I just want to make some declarations. Father, we worship you this evening. We magnify you. We give you honor and glory. All the praise belong to you. We thank you, Lord, as we come to your table this evening, even in the midst of our fast and prayer, Lord, we thank you that you are our protection. We thank you, Lord, that that. Um, under the shadow of the almighty in the secret place of the most high God. That is where we find our protection in the in Christ position. Oh, we thank you, Lord Jesus, that we can come to your table this evening. And there is protection at your table. There's grace at your table. And so we partake of the elements this evening. When we partake of the bread, we thank you, Lord, for divine healing. When we partake of your blood this evening, we thank you for divine forgiveness. We come to your table out of obedience this evening. And we declare, Father, that we are one as you are one. We thank you that you reconcile us to yourself. We thank you that you reconcile us to one another. We thank you that at this table, Lord Jesus, that we access grace, grace to live, grace to operate in favor, grace to do our daily 
uh, task, Lord. Oh, dominion grace, Father, to overcome, Father, to go onward and forward, to manifest the light of God, to manifest the kingdom of God, to destroy the works of the wicked one, to expose the works of the wicked one. And we declare that for this purpose, the Son of God is manifested to destroy the works of the devil. I declare this evening that the sons of God will begin to manifest all around the world, Father. May your sons manifest as all of the earth is waiting in labor pains, desiring the manifestation of the sons of God. We declare the maturity of sons of God in your church, Lord. We thank you for your church. We declare that we love your church. We love your body. We love your body. And so we pray this evening for all the saints, Lord. We pray for the church this evening. We thank you for your church, Lord, that comes to to, to maturity that becomes a mature man let your church rise up as one man we pray for every city in our nation and the nations of the world let the church of the city come together lord oh we pray for pastors to come to maturity we pray for pastors to begin to seek out one another to begin to gather with one another to begin to fellowship around your word father we pray for pastors who are suffering we pray for pastors pastors who are persecuted. We pray for pastors who are lacking this evening. We thank you, Father, that you will raise them up, Father, and let them rise up in your word in the name of Jesus. We declare your light, Father. Let the light of your kingdom um, manifest in a crooked, in a dark and crooked generation when your light manifests. We thank you, Father, that your kingdom is coming in the name of Jesus. We partake of the bread, we partake of the wine, and I thank you for sharing this evening with us. We will come together next Wednesday evening for our weekly prayer meeting. In Jesus' name, amen.